Now this next prophecy is the one that is of interest to me. White feather delivers a prophecy. I have this relationship with white feathers. And this prophecy was given to me just as I was going to Tanzania. The eighth sign is that the youth of the white man will grow their hair long and they will go to live with the last indigenous tribes of the planet and learn their ways. Hey guys, I want to make a video about a very powerful and wonderful tribe, the Hopi tribe. Now, I want to speak specifically not about the Hopi ways of life and so on. Don't feel I know enough on the topic for that. But throughout my whole journey of awakening and growing to become the man that I am today, from the man that I once was, which was a much less favorable and enjoyable character for myself, shall we say, there has been a prophecy that I'm aware of, and I always thought that this prophecy was fascinating, truly fascinating, and that is the prophecy of the blue star Kachina. Now, it was spoken to a minister who was traveling in the desert, and he picked somebody up, and this old Hopi guy he picked up said his, na his name was Whitefeather. Now, of course, Whitefeather, for me, has a great symbology. You all know I get feathers, and I call them feathers from heaven. They guide me. They, they appear at times where I'm calling out to God and needing comfort. A feather will blow into my, into my range in a bizarre way. I once had a guy who was living a non-spiritual path in Tanzania, English guy, and he was totally overindulging in all of the negatives of of. Babylon, let's call it that way, you know, the overindulgence of alcohol and, uh, and sexual immorality and so on and so forth. But he was quite in line and I kept talking to him about white feathers and sometimes we'd be standing, there was nothing above us but blue sky and one came down. There was another time he was sitting telling his friend about it. One blew into the barn, landed on his laptop. It was spirit trying to get his attention and trying to say, hey, Come on, take this road, as the Hopi or the Native Americans would say, take the red road, don't take the black one. Take the, the road of the, the higher self, not the lower self. And these feathers are just a profound constant going on in my life. And they have happened without fail at every single major point in my life. People dying, so on and so forth. The day my grandmother died, I stood on the beach. She was dying of lung cancer and we knew she would die. It's a very personal story I've shared with very few people. I feel compelled in this moment to do so. I said a prayer and I said to my great grandparents, I said, I have not met you, but I know you're there. My grandmother is in a lot of pain and I know she's hanging on to have as much time as she can with everybody that she loves. But I think soon the pain she's in, it's, it's time for you to come and get her. My grandmother earlier that day had said she could see her father waiting at the gate of the garden whilst she was very ill. She was dying of lung cancer and hooked up on oxygen, etc. I said it. I was standing on rocks at the rock pools going out into the ocean. I said that prayer, I walked to the beach and I got a strong feeling that my grandmother was about to pass away. I just felt it. I just knew. And a feather came blowing down the beach and stuck to the end of my shoe. About 10 seconds later, my father called me uh, to, say, <laughs> to say that she had passed. My grandmother did want me to be there uh, when she passed, which is why I was down the beach. Feathers, for me, have been profound, and that's why White Feather was poignant for me, very poignant. Feathers can be a way to give people belief where there was skepticism. 
or where there was a need for belief. I handed my mother a book once called Signs from Above and a book of short stories about people receiving signs from loved ones and within there were feathers. She left the book and went out with my father. When they came back there was a white feather next to the book and she asked my father if he'd put it there and he had not. And they were staying in Cumbria, nobody goes to the house at that side of the country when my father's working, I was not there. God uses many things and that is one thing. So white feathers stuck with me. Now the prophecy of Kachina is the coming of the new age, of the new world. Now it's not new age, it's <laughs> because I know there's many people, oh, new age, it's not, it's not about that. It's about the time of reckoning and it's about a time where we're supposed to answer for what's been going on. And when this blue star appears in the sky, we know that as the Hopi say, we're going to move to the next world, the next level of, of human consciousness, the, the next development. And we've seen the development of that Dark Ages, Iron Ages, Stone Ages, so on. So we do see humans growing and evolving in consciousness. These tribes were not crazy. I actually plant our food in Tanzania off the back of the Hopi's instructions, the Three Sisters. So we plant uh, pumpkin, which the leaves allow the moisture to not evaporate. We plant maize, which grows quickly out of the ground. And we, cr we plant beans, one on either side, which climb up the maize the three sisters, the Hopi way. So we, we do know that the practices of these people were deeply, profoundly, scientifically proven just by the fact that they'd applied them. Now, this prophecy is, it, it has eight signs before the blue star Kachina comes. And the reason I find this so fascinating is because I was shown this prophecy just as I'd gone to Tanzania to live with the Maasai tribe. So let me go through and you'll hear the sign that I feel is relative to my journey, especially at coming from Whitefeather. So the prophecy was delivered to Whitefeather and the prophecy speaks of Pahana. And Pahana is a white man that had visited the Hopi tribe and left to go to Kachina Kachina, if you ask a Hopi, they will point at Sirius in the sky. That in itself is fascinating because there are African tribes who have information about the location of Sirius B in a working model that was passed down to them who say that they had a visitor who was pale skinned who came from the stars. The Hopi had the same visitor, it would seem. We should not rule out that there is other life out there as well, of course. So. The Hopi say that Pahana delivered a message of oneness and love and hope and peace. The first prophecy is that white men like Pahana will arrive but don't live like him. They will be greedy, they will be evil. And whether you want to admit it or not, our ancestry were evil. We went there and we were more primitive than the natives we dared to call primitive. We robbed, we pillaged, we stole, we destroyed. We went in the name of Christianity. But then if that's the case, Christianity doesn't work because that means that you're separating from having the love that Jesus Christ spoke of being inside you and part of you. To go there in the name of Christianity, realistically what people were saying were, I have a construct within my lower nature. It's a carnal construct of who I am. I'm greedy, I want this, I want that. I'm not saying everybody did this, but the majority. And I am going to bolt onto that construct of my carnal lower nature, the idea of Christianity. And I'm gonna to go to church on a Sunday and I'm gonna then hopefully feel a bit better about the wrongs that I'm doing. The propaganda that came out of that first wave of European settlers was horrendous. They took beautiful truths. For instance, most of the native tribes feel that you should die outside, looking up at the, at the bare sky. I have a really wonderful Christian friend, an elderly lady, who fell for the propaganda and said, well, isn't it horrible that they put old people out to die on their own because they saw them as a burden? 
I said, no, this is not what it was. It was to die with Mother Earth right there in front of you. And this is the, the massive problem we face. The Europeans that arrived, they were walking the black road, not the red road. The red road in native culture is the higher self. The Europeans that arrived were not in the higher self like Pahana. They were in their lower self and thus they were on the black road. The second prophecy said that wheels will come that carry voices across the land. Of course, wheels did come in the form of horse and cart carrying settlers who were chatting inside. Indeed, wheels came carrying voices across the land. The next prophecy, the prophecy states that a beast will arrive to the land like the buffalo, but with horns. Indeed, the beast did arrive. And due to the fact that we European settlers were immature and not spiritually developed as the tribes were, and had a propensity for invention, which didn't mean that we had a mature, as we don't still have today, propensity for invention. We wanted money. So aside from destroying all the, and killing all the buffalo for pelts, we also farmed all of the land with our cattle and we kept them on the same land over and over again to the point where we started destroying it. And of course, we weren't taking just what we need because we had certain setups and economies. People were, first of all getting obese off the back of mother nature's sacrifice of herself then they were getting rich off it as well by overselling items or they were allowing their belly to be their god as the bible states those who don't know jesus christ belly their belly is their god and the stomach of those humans that arrived in the most part the stomach was their god their desires were was the belonged to, the, the god of themselves was their desires so making fancy foods that taste even better, so on and so forth, really destroyed the place using these cattle that they brought and we still see the remnants of that today. The next prophecy states that there will be an iron snake that crisscrosses the land. And of course, that's self-explanatory with the railway. The next prophecy is that there will be uh, stone rivers all across the land, which are of course the road networks. The sixth prophecy, the sixth prophecy is that a giant cobweb will cover the land. Now this is an interesting one, because today there's a big debate about geoengineering and chemtrails. There is a patent out there of great interest that says mixing aluminium with jet fuel will still around, allow the plane to run, but it will allow you to create uh, trails in the sky that will deflect solar radiation, and it is patented to help deflect uh, any sort of additional global warming due to changes from the sun and the, uh, the solar rays and heat that it's emitting. I have been a very observant person all of my life and I can tell you now that the skies have changed since I was a child. Planes did not leave trails that turned into clouds that created cloud cover. People who argue that it's not the case are dishonest because there's no way those people have actually ever spent time just breathing outside for hours on end and observing their environment and it doesn't make them bad people 
It just means that, like all of us, we have a construct, an ego, a carnal mind that never wants to admit that it's made a mistake or that it's been lazy, etc. No, nobody wants to do it. But the reality is, we are spraying as a species. We are spraying the skies right now. I can't see how anyone can say we are not. I can see it in the city here. And I know when cloud cover is coming. Fritzi and I will both watch and you see the certain type of contrail which becomes a chemtrail as they say and you see the certain ones disappear and then all of a sudden there are these ones that start fanning out and they stay for hours and hours and then they clear, create cloud cover. We can tell what day is going to be cloud cover and what not be, depending on how those chemtrails are sprayed or how these contrails form. People have told me it's because of cold temperatures etc etc. I just can't accept it anymore. The Iranian government stated clearly that the European nations and the America and uh, United States of America were creating webs in the sky using this technology to starve of the nations of rainfall or to overburden them with rainfall to get them to fall in line with the regime of the central banking industrial military complex. They're not insane people, guys. There's something to it. And I say that I don't see how all of a sudden the sky can be different now to what it was when I was a child, because it is. Thus, the web is present from this prophecy. The web has stretched over the United States of America and indeed the rest of the world in the most part. Now, you could say that that's wrong, fine. Then what could the web be other than that? Well, it could be electricity wires. That's the other one it could be. Either way, the webs have formed across the country, and I don't think it's debatable that they have, whichever way you look at it. The next prophecy is profound as well. The next prophecy states that you will see a time where the oceans turn black and a great many lives will be lost, and a lot of life will be lost and a lot of destruction will be caused by it. We've seen it with the oil spills on this planet. We have pulled the lifeblood of Mother Earth out and we've spilled it by accident and we've wrecked the place. If you go somewhere like Nigeria, where they found oil, you will see very clearly the place, some areas are like a Martian land. Nothing is living or growing there. People are displaced. People are trying to catch fish in black water. The waters have turned black however way you look at it, and many lives have been lost during that time. Now this next prophecy is the one that is of interest to me. White Feather delivers a prophecy. I have this relationship with White Feathers. In fact, speaking of uh, White Feathers, I have one here. So White Feather delivers this, relationship, uh, delivers this message, and I have this relationship with this, and this prophecy was given to me just as I was going to Tanzania. The eighth sign is that the youth of the white man will grow their hair long and they will go to live with the last indigenous tribes of the planet and learn their ways. And indeed, I am one of very few Europeans who has the ability to call himself a Maasai. Thanks to the love and the, the embrace of a tribe that I can call family and have decided to call me a brother and a father. I have gone to be with the indigenous tribes of this world, some of the last. And what I do know is if this world goes into World War Three and an economy collapse, the economy collapses, some people who will live their life as if nothing ever happened are many of the Maasai. Those influenced by Western development, different story, but those not. Those out there that I do know as well, out in the bush, totally out of the way, who I have lived with, it, they would not even know anything happened. Their pure and simple way of life would continue on land that most humans would not have a clue where to start living or how to start living there. I've always been aware of that, and I've also been aware that I have learned that ability from the Maasai, thankfully, and I praise God that I have. In 2011, when I knew I was going, 
Tanzania, I stopped cutting my hair. The prophecy came to me, was shown to me, its existence was shown to me not long after that. And indeed, I've carried on growing my hair. I've only uh, cut it three times since then, I think, all in all. Make of this all what you will, and I'm only putting it out to, in the hope that it stirs something in you that it did in me, a, a, a sacred interest, a, a stimulation deep in my soul that says, what is that? What, what quite is that? Well, it might not, because you might not have the white feathers that I have. You might not have that coming from spirit. You might not have grown your hair long and gone to live with an indigenous tribe. Most of you have not. But you know someone who has, and in following 1111, I've seen a Hopi chief speak of 1111 as part of a sign of the Blue Star Kachina. The final sign is the appearance of the Blue Star in the sky. And at that time, Pahana will return and the purification of man will begin and the movement to the fifth world will begin, as the Hopi call it. What that means, I do not know. Is it even true? I leave you to make your own mind upon it. But for me, I find it a deeply profound and beautiful thing to look at. Because the European settlers who are our ancestry, who went there. We did not have it right. We all went without any majority of us, without any inwardly sacred aspect of ourselves, no direct connection inside ourselves with God, which was never what Jesus Christ wanted, wanted at all. But in the name of Jesus Christ, we went there as lower self beings in the most part, driven by greed and the excitement of land and money and gold. And we lied and we cheated and we stole and we poisoned. We destroyed the land. We made treaties with these wonderful people and we destroyed it. We created propaganda up to our ears about these persons. And if you, if you look at the tribes and what they spoke of, if you look at the Navajo, their spiritual system is nearly identical to that of the Tibetans, including the mandalas, etc. It's unbelievable how advanced they were, and we know that the Tibetan monks are extremely spiritually advanced. At least they were carrying compassion. Now, I'm not saying every European settler that went was uncompassionate, but in the most part, we know the natives always came off worse wherever we went, because we went as lower beings we went disconnected from the earth with an ability to invent, but without the maturity to invent what was best in the name of a compassionate and moral uh, benefit to our species, no matter where we come from, race, color or creed. Instead, we went with this profound intellect to invent. However, using that technology, we dominated and we, we pillaged and we killed. We went as lower beings with a label of Christianity, with the label of a loving God. And it's very clear. I once heard a, a quote from a native chief who said, and I'll end with this. I've never understood what the missions were bringing for us because they tried so desperately to push upon us a religion that they themselves did not adhere to. And that's exactly summed up what was going on. And that's what I keep needing to keep teaching what I am. Because for a percentage of people, Christianity works. They get it. But for a vast percentage of people, it doesn't. And I want to find out why. And I believe the reason why is the constant externalization of God and the constant, due to that, manic nature of the mind of people. And due to that manic nature, God can't communicate with them because there's no stillness there. And, of course, on top of that, as Jesus said, take no thought for tomorrow. And what happens with persons who are manic? 
They're never here. They're never present. They're tomorrow or they're in the past. They're, they're in their desires of what they might get. They're in the illusion, the dreams of what life they want instead of being grateful for the life they were given. Whereas the tribes had that. Not, they weren't perfect. There were problems with tribes. There were very primitive aspects of it. The Christian missions, Livingston, who arrived in Tanzania, there was a lot of cannibalism and so on. So that loving message needed to be brought in there. But he brought that loving message. But what happened beyond him? Christians came and took slaves. What happened to the message? It only worked for a percentage. I believe the reason it only worked for a percentage is we don't sit our children down and allow them, whilst they are in academics, to find an inner connection with God. Because when they find that inner connection with God and they don't externalize, I believe it becomes impossible to not generate enough empathy to allow you to live as Jesus Christ asked and not live as someone who labels themselves a Christian whilst carrying on doing the harm and the loveless aspects that the European settlers who massacred the native tribes did. Blue Star Kachina. Beautiful prophecy and something that stirred deep in my soul for quite some time, a great deal of wonder. God bless, guys. <laughs>